afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome. We are delighted to be hosting Professor James Foreman of the Yale Law School here to discuss the critically important topic of mass incarceration in the United States. Let me begin by thanking Order of the Coit for making this event possible. Each year, the Scholarly Society selects a distinguished visitor who, uh, whose work touches on critical issues of law and social policy and invites schools to apply to have that speaker come and deliver a, a lecture and meet with students. We were thrilled when we were one of the three schools selected to host Professor Foreman. We have a special guest who will introduce Professor Foreman in a moment. But before turning things over to him, I'd like to offer just a few brief observations about Professor Foreman's book, Locking Up Our Own, Crime and Punishment in Black America. If you've had a chance to read it, you know it paints a searing picture of crime and incarceration, primarily in Washington, D.C. That picture includes elements of absolutely unvarnished racism. But as Professor Foreman insightfully reveals, the picture is more complex. It also includes leaders who cared deeply about their community and who understood that one of the serious injustices since Reconstruction has been the failure to protect African Americans from lawlessness. So how do we get where we are? Professor Foreman observes that, and I'll quote, as the tough on crime movement gathered force, those who have been arrested or convicted rarely participated in debate over criminal justice policy in DC or nationally. They rarely told their stories and their invisibility helps explain why our criminal justice system became so punitive. As we think about law and policy on a grand scale, it is easy to forget those individual stories. Easy to lose track of the Sandra Doziers who bear the brunt of our policy choices. Our special guest, who will introduce Professor Foreman, is someone who never loses track of those individuals because he works with them. Rodney Robinson teaches at the Virgie Binford Education Center in the Richmond Juvenile Det Detention Center. He's a member of Mayor uh, LeVar Stoney's Education Compact Team, and he is also the 2019 National Teacher of the Year. His site <laughs> His citation for this prestigious award commended him for empowering his students, many of whom have experienced trauma, to become civically minded social advocates who use their skills and voices to affect po policy changes at their schools and in their communities. Mr. Robinson earned his bachelor's of history from Virginia State University, his master's in education from VCU. Additionally, Mr. Robinson has a special connection with our guest, having worked with Professor Foreman at the Yale Teachers Institute, developing curricula on race, class, and punishment. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Robinson. Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> Um, it's weird because I was trying to write down remarks and I realized that's really not me. So I'll just, you know, I'll go off my top of my head, but I'll be brief. Um, met James last year at the Yale Teachers Institute because um, he was teaching a seminar on race, class, and punishment. And I figured that sounds pretty much like my app, considering I work inside the Richmond Juvenile Detention Center. And, um, when I first met him, it's like, you don't know, you know. Sometimes when you meet people, you really don't know, you know, who they really are. But within 10 minutes, he made us feel welcome. You know, he, he came down, like, when you think when you go into the, such prestigious year, but immediately he was on our level. He talked to us, and more importantly, he's a teacher. And I'm not just saying that because he teaches, you know, law, but he taught high school. So this is definitely something that I can relate to. 
And he also taught students that were caught up in the system, which was also something that I could relate to. And so he often talked about his days. And even though he talks about those days teaching in DC, he never talked about it with a front. Whenever he talked about those kids, his time in DC, he was always had a smile on his face. And he even showed us a documentary of him teaching in DC, which I think Sean found it. It cost us a lot of money to get it, but I think he found it. Um, but it was just really good feeling. And it was really important because when I went to Yale, I was questioning, was juvenile detention the place for me? Because constantly I was getting pulled by everyone in the system to leave the juvenile detention system and go back to the comprehensive high schools. And I didn't know where I, what I wanted to do. But James gave me purpose in my work. He let me know that what I do is the most important job working with those who society has forgotten about, whose society doesn't care about anymore. Because when people get, go to the jail, they, it's like they're dead almost. You don't think about them. You don't, unless you're a close immediate family member, you just forget about them. But they're still here. They still deserve everything that people on the outside get. And that was a really important thing that he taught me. And I made it my point to make my students understand that that you deserve everything and it's your job and your voice to speak up and advocate for everything you think you deserve. And that's the biggest lesson I learned from James. And it's funny, I was telling you a story. I haven't seen you since to tell you this story, but we were, I had a student after I taught my Yale unit and um, he came back from um, a court or lawyer visit. He was like, man, my lawyer need to do his job. I was like, what do you mean do his job? He's like, he need to do his job. According to the case of 1968, Terry versus Ohio, I was illegally searched. I was like, okay. And his lawyer did his job, and he ended up going home and beating his charge. And so, you know, that, that was just really funny to me, but that's the power that he instilled in me to instill in my students, that you are your best advocate. You, got, you need to fight and speak up for what you need. And that's what I hope that you will take from this message today. When you see injustice, when you see things that aren't right, speak up. Because often those who are experiencing injustice have, don't have the voice to speak up. Or that voice is being completely silenced. So if there's anything I want you to take away from here today, just take away, use your voice to speak up for those whose voices have been silent. And that's the best thing I learned from James. So without any further ado, Mr. James Foreman. I want to I want to thank uh, Dean Perdue and and President Crutcher. I want to thank Emily Cherry, who has done an amazing job organizing um, this event, um, and I want to thank my friend uh, Rodney Robinson. Rodney said that he was in doubt at some point about the value or the importance of his work. And I, the one thing that I want to say is I'm the sort of person, I, I went to public schools in Atlanta, New York, Detroit, and you know, whenever there's, whenever you're boarding an airplane and they have the people who are military veteran uh, board first, or I'm at the baseball game and they honor our veterans. I'm, I honor them and I'm proud to honor people who are serving, but I always feel like I want that same honor for our teachers. And because the work that you do every day is so important. And it's not just Rodney, but there's some other teachers from Richmond Public Schools here today. And I would just ask that you all stand at this moment and be honored.
So we know about the five teachers, but I want to know a little bit more about other folks who are in the audience. So I'm just going to ask if y'all will uh, indulge me here. I'd like to know a little bit more about who's in the room. So I'm going to ask anybody who has been arrested or been incarcerated for any period of time to please stand. I'd like to ask anybody who has a friend, or please remain standing if you don't mind, sir. I would like to ask anybody who's a friend or a family member or a loved one who has been arrested or incarcerated to please stand. I would like you to stand. I want to ask you to stand. By the way, y'all should just look around the room to just what I just said. I'd like you to stand if you work in the criminal system in any way, as a lawyer, as a judge, as a probation officer, if you teach in a prison or jail, please stand. Please stand if you are a student and you are thinking about one day working in some way in the criminal system, please stand. If you believe in second chances, I would like to ask you to please stand. Look around the room. Look at the power. Look at the power that's in this room from our collective experience. Thank you. I'm gonna talk to you today a little bit about my research I want to mention. Uh, Dean Perdue mentioned my book. It's going to be on sale outside. I'm going to be signing books, and, and I don't want to forget, so I'm just going to mention this now, but um, I don't know how things are now, but when I was a student, I was on heavy, heavy financial aid, and financial aid is... It's amazing, I'm only here now because of it. But it only covered the basics. It never seemed like it covered anything extra. And I remember going to a book talk when I was in college. It was a poet, Nikki Giovanni, was on campus. And I wanted to get, I wanted to get all her books. But I had a very careful budget and there was no budget for just spur of the moment book purchase. So I can't say I thought of it then because I wasn't, I wasn't, I would say like, I, I don't know the right word for it, but maybe it was humility. I didn't imagine then I would ever write a book. But when I did decide, when I did write a book and I went to my first university, I said then, and I'll say now, which is that I want anybody in the audience, student or not, who wants to get a copy of the book, to get a copy of the book. We operate on, a, I operate on a pay what you can basis. And if what you have to offer is a smile to the bookseller, then please offer that smile to the bookseller and get your copy of the book and I'll be glad to sign it. I want to talk a little bit about my research. And I want to start that conversation by telling you how I came to want to write this book, and I want to do that through a story. There's a lot of stories. There's history and arguments, a little tiny bit of law in, a, in the book, but really, fundamentally, it's wrapped in a set of stories. And one of the stories is of a young man that I represented by the name of Brandon. Brandon was a teenage client of mine. He was charged with and been convicted of possession of a gun and small amount of marijuana. And I was his lawyer, I'd been assigned to represent him. And I had taken the job because I thought this was the civil rights struggle of my generation. See, my parents met in the original civil rights movement. They met in SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the 1960s. My dad is black and my mom is white. They're an interracial couple. And they got together at a time when those marriages were illegal in many states in this country. And I, as I know, y'all know in the state of Virginia, of all states, their generation changed and transformed this nation. 
Theirs was the generation that faced down Bull Connor's dogs, that marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, that went to D.C. 250,000 strong for the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. Right, their generation brought us the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, the Fair Housing Act of 68. Those laws were passed by Congress and signed by presidents, yes, but I know they teach you here that the only reason that those were passed, the only reason Congress acted, the only reason presidents acted was because people marched and people protested and people demanded, people stood up for those that didn't have a voice, as Rodney Robinson asked you all to do. And they made it possible for African Americans of my generation to have opportunities that were unimaginable to previous generations. And yet and still, even with all that change, I could see when I was graduating from law school that there was unfinished business to the civil rights movement. And I'm not saying this is the only area because there's more, but the area that I saw it playing out, the area where I saw the unfinished business was in our criminal legal system. You'll hear me use different words. In the book, I talk about the criminal justice system. And since I've been working on the book, like more and more people, I've started to alter my vocabulary a little bit. I'm not entirely sure that the system deserves to have the name justice in the title, so you'll hear me refer to it sometimes as that, sometimes as the criminal legal system, or sometimes just the criminal system. What I knew when I graduated from law school even though we didn't have the term mass incarceration then. That was a term that was created in the year 2000 by activists and advocates trying to describe this phenomenon. We didn't have the term, but we had the underlying data. We already knew in the 1990s, we knew that one in three young black men would, was under criminal justice supervision. We knew that black women were the largest and fastest, the fastest growing part of the prison system. We already knew that the United States had passed Russia and South Africa to earn the dishonor of the world's largest jailer. We already, by the mid-1990s, we had 5% of the world's population and 25% of its prisons. And I had seen some of the changes and transformations in American society that would help produce those numbers in my own life growing up. I grew up in a working class, borderline middle class neighborhood in Atlanta. And two blocks from my home in either direction were two enormous institutions. In one direction, if you went down to the corner and turned right, you got to a General Motors plant. If you went down to the corner and turned left and walked two blocks, you got to the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary. That's when I was a kid. Now, fast forward 15 years later, I'm graduating from law school. One of those buildings has shut down, jobs shipped overseas, and the other building had built an addition, an extra wing. I don't think I need to tell this audience which is which. If I do, come see me later. <laughs> so I wanted to fight that fight. And that brought me to Superior Court, Washington, D.C., standing next to Brandon, asking for him to be put on probation. I had a letter from a teacher and a counselor at his school. It was his first arrest. His mother and grandmother were there in court. They had been there for every court hearing. They wanted him to come home. The prosecutor in the case, she was asking for him to go to a place called Oak Hill. Now, Oak Hill, I don't know how they do here, but in a lots of parts of the country, what they do with juvenile facilities is they take a very nice-sounding name, Oak Tree on a Hill, and they combine it with a terrible, violent, brutal reality, and that was the case with Oak Hill. No treatment programs, a barely a functioning school. I mean, there were some things on paper. If you went down to the mayor's office, they would claim, well, we have this, we have this, we have this, but if you spent time there, you saw they had none of it. It was a place where young people always left worse off than when they entered. 
The judge had to make the decision in the case, Judge Curtis Walker. That's not his real name. I changed the names of all the lawyers, the judges, of course, my clients, to protect the identities of my clients. It's not his real name, but he's a real judge. And he looks out of the courtroom. He's an African-American judge. About 40% of the judges in D.C. at the time were African-American. A little bit more now. And Judge Walker looks at Brandon, and he looks him hard and dead in the eye, and he says, son, Mr. Foreman's telling me that you've had a tough life. You deserve a second chance. Well, let me tell you about tough. Let me tell you about Jim Crow segregation. The judge had been a child in those years, so he proceeded to lecture Brandon on what it was like. And he said, so here's the thing, son. People fought, people marched, people died for your freedom. Dr. King died for you. And I tell you this, he didn't die for you to be running and gunning and thugging and carrying on, embarrassing your family, embarrassing your community, carrying that gun. So I hope Mr. Foreman is right. I hope you turn it around one day. But today in this courtroom, Actions have consequences. Your consequence is okay. Lock him up. I was so outraged. I mean, think about it. The judge had taken the same history that I just told you motivated me to be a public defender, and he had somehow twisted it around for this, in his mind, kind of more rationalization for why it made sense to lock up Brandon. As I began to work through my anger and my frustration at the judge, and I'm still in process on that, <laughs> I began to think about the fact that he wasn't alone. City council that passed the gun and drug laws that Brandon was being sentenced under was a majority black city council. Police force was majority black. Police chief was black. Mayor was black. Chief prosecutor in the city at the time was none other than Eric Holder before he would become known nationally. And I began to wrestle with this question that was haunting me, which is what happened in this country over the last 50 years that was so powerful, that was so dramatic, that was so all-encompassing, that even in a majority African-American community with some measure of control over local government and local politics and local policing, we were doing the same things. We were passing the same laws. We were doing the same policy choices, the same mandatory minimums, the same extreme sentences, the same brutal facilities. How did that come to be? That's the question of my book. Now, I'm not going to be able to answer that question completely tonight. The good news is y'all can go get a copy and get the whole answer. But I'll give you just a couple of the kind of main points. The first thing Dean Perdue alluded to this that we have to understand to figure out what happened. The rise in crime and violence and the fear and the anger that it generated in black communities throughout the country, but especially in black communities over the last 50 years, and especially in the 1960s and the 1980s. I argue those are the two crucial decades. The 1980s be more familiar to y'all somewhat. That's the crack years. It's gotten more attention in media and otherwise, the wire. But in the 1960s, before the crack years, heroin would do to black communities what crack would do two decades later. The homicide rate in this country doubled in the 1960s. It tripled in D.C., more than doubled in New York and Philadelphia and Atlanta. Heroin. They tested everyone entering the D.C. jail for drugs every year. In 1963, they found that 4% of the people entering the jail were heroin addicts. By 1969, the 4% had become 45%. Now, that's an epidemic. And it wasn't just those numbers. It was also the response that they produced. Researching this, I went and looked through archives of a lot of retired elected officials, some of them fortunately for me as a researcher, had turned their whole libraries over to archives and including letters that they had received from citizens. So it's this amazing, in the DC files, it's this amazing cultural and, and social history of a city. 
a majority, at the time, D.C. was 70% African American in the 1970s. It was called Chocolate City. So these are mostly black citizens writing to mostly black elected officials. 11 out of the first 13 city council members in the city, that original group, were African American. And what do these letters reveal? People say, I'm scared to take my kids to school. I'm scared to leave them in the park after school. They're shooting in the park. They're selling drugs on the corner. I feel like a prisoner in my own home. I feel like a stranger in my own city streets. And over and over again, these letters end with some version of do something, do something. You've got to do something about it. Who's receiving these letters? That's the second big argument in the book. The group of people receiving these letters is the first generation of black elected officials to be elected in any number in this country since Reconstruction. In the 1970s and 1980s, there's a 700% increase in African American elected officials nationwide. Now, it's a 700% increase over almost zero, but it's a 700% increase nonetheless. And it's because of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And this generation, what do we know about them? Many of them are from the South. Some of them were in the Civil Rights Movement. All of them remember the long history, as your dean pointed out, the long history of under-enforcement and under-protection of the law that has been part of the black experience in this country since the original under-protection of the law, which was slavery. So they remember that history. They remember Southern sheriffs in cahoots with the Klan. Asked about homicide in a black neighborhood, they said that's not a homicide, that's another dead black person. And they did not use the words black person. They remember, my dad used to tell me about this. He talked about, he grew up in Jim Crow, south side of Chicago. He said, man, we didn't, black neighborhood, we didn't call the police. When there was a crime, the police weren't going to come. And if they came, the only thing you could be sure of is they will make matters worse. So they remember this history. They're shaped by this history. And now they're in office and they're determined with the power they have, whatever measure they have, they're determined to make the law responsive to those communities, those letter writers who are pleading for protection. Okay, so crime is rising, people are scared, addiction is taking over communities, and there's a generation of officials, some of them have even a racial justice motivation, we could call it, to respond. But why police and prosecutors and prisons? Why is that the response? And here's where my book is fundamentally a book about black communities. It's about the black political, intellectual, cultural traditions. It's about black politics. But any book that's about black politics also has to be a book about the larger society, the larger structures that limit and constrain and contain the ability of these elected officials to act. So let me mention just a couple of those constraints. The first one is political. Black political power has always been concentrated at the local level, local politics, city council, mayor's offices, county councils. And one of the arguments in my book is that local politics is important to understand how we got here. But there are limits to what local politicians can do, and you see that throughout the book. Because what you see is black elected officials having what I call an all-of-the-above strategy to fighting crime and violence. They want more police and prosecutors, and sometimes, unfortunately, they even want more prisons. But they also want more jobs and more drug treatment and more housing and more education. They want more after-school programs. They wanted what many call the Marshall Plan for urban America. So for 50 years, they go to Congress with this all-of-the-above strategy, and for 50 years, they come back from Congress with money for one of the above, law enforcement, police and prosecutors. The other constraint is historical. 
This first generation of black elected officials that comes into office, they have been elected to represent communities that because of a history of racism, starting with slavery, which we just need to start with this understanding. Whenever we talk about slavery, please understand that we are talking about most of American history. 1619 to 1865 is more years than 1865 to the present. So starting with slavery, which was then followed up by Jim Crow, segregation. So white supremacy in law from 1619 to, you pick your year, Brown v. Board, 54, Civil Rights Act, six, you pick what you want to say is the ending point. I'm not going to argue about that. What I'm going to tell you is that whatever year you pick, we're now talking about 90% of American history. And that included specific policies to rob and destroy black communities. That included redlining so black homeowners couldn't get loans to improve their homes. That included things we've forgotten about today like the federal highway system. 1950s, 19, early 1960s, we built all those I whatever, those signs we take for granted. Those were built on somebody's land. Where were they put? In most places, they were put in the neighborhoods, through the neighborhoods, with the least political clout and power. I'll just give you Atlanta. Who's driven through Atlanta? All right. You've probably driven on I-75 or I-85. And you may not realize it when you're driving, but right before you get to downtown, Grady Hospital's on the right, you're driving through what was once the Black Wall Street. Auburn Avenue, Dr. King was raised there, thriving, robust black neighborhood. Destroyed. Still trying to recover to this day, but damaged and almost destroyed when the federal highways were put right through the middle of it. So as a result of all of this concentrated heat, years of heaped on abuse, you get black elected officials who are representing neighborhoods that lack the resources to represent and protect themselves. So they're over-reliant on police and prosecutors for protection. The last constraint that I'll mention. This is a generation of officials that was constrained by their imaginations in how to respond to what were real and pressing genuine social problems. What do I mean by constrained by their imaginations? Let me give you an example. One of the people writing about is a guy named David Clark. David Clark was one on the original city council in Washington, D.C. Dean Perdue is smiling because David Clark is a legendary figure in D.C. politics. He was one, I told you all that 11 of 13 members of that first city council were, were black. David Clark was one of the two white members. He had a fascinating bio. He went to Howard Law School in the 1960s. He worked for Martin Luther King. When he got out of law school, he became a lawyer for poor people, and then he ran for city council, and he won. The thing for these purposes that you should know about David Clark is that he was not a drug warrior. In fact, the first piece of legislation that he pursued when he got into office in 1975 was marijuana decriminalization. Five years later, six years later, early 1980s now, and heroin, I told you all about heroin in the 60s, heroin has come back in force, and there's an upsurge in letters, people complaining about heroin addicts gathering on stoops, gathering on corners, nodding off in alleys, leaving dirty syringes everywhere. And these letters end with some form of do something, do something. You've got to do something about it. Okay, so David Clark is chair of the city council. He gets these letters, and he forwards them to the head of the relevant government agency. And he gets a letter back each time saying, Councilman Clark received your letter about the her complaint, citizen complaint about heroin addicts. We're on the case. 
That's good. Who does this non-drug warrior, marijuana decriminalizer, forward the letters to? Remember, the problem is heroin addicts in public space. That's the stated complaint. Department of Mental Health, Addiction Services, Treatment and Rehabilitation. Now, y'all know who he sends them to? Police chief. Because even though he's not a drug warrior, He's an American, and like so many of us, he's been conditioned to think of the problem of an heroin addict in public space as a problem that you respond to with somebody who has the only tools at their disposal are handcuffs, and the only place they can take you for treatment where there is none is the local jail. So he can't imagine this in his time as a public health problem. He can only imagine it as a police and criminal law problem. And one of my arguments in the book, one of my central arguments, is that when we, to understand how we got mass incarceration, and also how we're going to have to demolish it, it's tempting to look at a statement, statement of presidents or acts of Congress but it's just as crucial that we look at the tiny, small decisions made under the radar, behind closed doors, some of them, not all of them, but some of them made by people with good intentions, like Dave Clark. These tiny, small decisions, like which government official, which government agency to reach out to when you're deluged with citizen complaints about heroin, and that it's those tiny decisions that are the individual bricks that collectively have built the prison nation that America has become. Now, when I was in school, I used to go to, I was the kind of student, probably some of y'all are like this too because you're here, at least those of you that came here voluntarily as opposed to those who a professor made you come. I would always go to these talks about whatever the social justice issue of that was you know, available to hear about, I was there. And they always had the same thing. They always would the person come and they would present their issue that they work on in hopefully compelling um, but certainly they were presented in some detail, and then when they were finished making us completely depressed, they would like pack up their PowerPoint and leave. My work is done. Now, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to spend a little bit, the last time that I have before, before moving on to questions, I want to spend the last time that I have talking a little bit about what we can do individually and what we can do collectively in response. And I want to say that I've, I've, been, I've been asked this question about, you know, what can we do, and I've been thinking about this so much so that I've started putting materials on my website that are some of the, like, sources that back up things that I'm going to talk about right here. So later, at your leisure, if you go look at James Foreman junior.com, you'll see Take Action, and if you click on that link, you'll see various kind of resources that connect to some of the points that I'm going to be making here. The first thing that I want to say is, is not a particular action, but it is a way of thinking about the problem, and it's connected to something that Rodney said earlier, and it's based on a story about a conversation that I had with my mom. This is when I was in high school, and we moved a lot when I was a kid. There's a lot of really good things about being the child of parents in the civil rights movement, but school stability is not one of them. We, we, we moved a lot. My parents are, were harassed by the COINTEL program, which we can get into later if people want to talk more about that. But we moved a lot. I went to 10 schools for 12 grades. 
And I was in a new high school, and it was first or second day, and I was in the bathroom, and I saw a scene that really disturbed me. And it was, I didn't really have the term, I knew it was bullying. What I didn't really have the terms for, but came to learn, was basically this kid was being bullied by, it wasn't physical, but it was emotional, and it was, it was wrong, and it was how he dressed and walked, and it was his emerging sexual identity that was the, produced, that was making him their target. And I went home, I was so upset, and I talked to my mom about it, and I told her the whole story. And I had ideas for what she could do in response. My mom was one of those moms that was like always up in the school about this, that, and the other thing, <laughs> including stuff I didn't want her to be up there about. Complain so I won't even get into the details, but I was like, Mom, here's actually something that I would welcome your participation on. And I had ideas for what the principal, assistant principal, how they could do to change the bathroom structure, more guards and monitors. And my mom said, I appreciate that you have all these ideas for what people can do. She said, I just have one question. Y'all probably know where she was going with this, but she looked at me and she said, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And I really try to think, I try to take that with me in my work because I feel like sometimes these problems are so massive and they seem so, they render us powerless because of their size and their scope and their scale. And so then I always try to come down to this question of, well, what can I do? So I'm gonna mention a couple of things that are pieces of my work and I don't say them because they're necessarily, per se, the most important things, but I do th think that they are important, but almost more as, as, as invitations. So the first thing that we should keep in mind is that this problem that I'm describing is fundamentally a state and local problem. The tonight, probably, I don't know, they're probably gonna be asked questions tonight at the camp, at the debate, for any people who watch the debate or any of the future debates, about what they're going to do as president about mass incarceration. And that's fine. But that gets all the attention. But fundamentally, this is a state, county, and local issue. 88% of people who are in prison in this country are in prison in a state, county, or local facility, not the federal. 85% of law enforcement in this country is state, county, and local. And to me, that's an opportunity because that means that fewer of us can have an impact than if it's something that we know we have to change in Washington, D.C., that something that we need to change as an act of Congress. I mean, if you care about mandatory minimums, the most important legislator that you all need to be thinking about or office that you want to run for is your state legislature. If you care about school-to-prison pipeline, you will have a bigger impact on zero tolerance policies by running for the school board than you would as president or governor. This is one of the opportunities presented by our local system. One of the areas that I work on is education. I started out, Rod mentioned, teaching at the high school level started an alternative school for kids in the juvenile justice system. So as a result of that, one of the contributions that I wanted to try to make is I, I've created a curriculum guide on teaching mass incarceration. Um, it's free. Uh, it's available on my website. But what I've done more kind of directly in my life is I've started thinking about the fact, well, I'm a university professor. I teach in college. I teach at a college. And where have some of the gr most grotesque cuts been? Some of the worst cuts have been at the K-12 level, yes, and also at the opportunities for higher education for men and women who are incarcerated. The 1994 crime legislation eliminated Pell Grants, for prisoners, and as a result, many colleges and universities stopped doing work in their local prisons. 
And I started thinking about my mom's question, well, what could I do about that? So I got trained in a program called Inside Out. I decided to join the prison education movement. And I had the opportunity earlier, right before this talk, to a group of educators on this campus who is as passionate and determined as any I've seen anywhere in the country. And those of y'all who are interested in this question of prison education here at University of Richmond, please find one of your faculty members who is working on this. There's seven or eight that were sitting around the table, and I don't think that, and there's more than that who weren't at the table. What I do in Inside Out is I take students from Yale and Quinnipiac Law Schools, and we go together, and they study alongside incarcerated men. In the fall, I teach men, and in the spring, I teach women. Incarcerated men or incarcerated women, we take, they take a class on the criminal justice system together as peers. They're not, the law students are not there to teach. They're not there to volunteer. Those things are important. But that's not what we're doing. This is an educational community. The students are there as peers, studying and learning the material together. And let me tell you, it is transformative. It is transformative in the lives of my law students. I, you can imagine, not to say that, not to say that opening a case book and having the Socratic method in classroom for three years is not the most exciting way to ever learn the material. But sometimes it's nice to have a change of pace. And so they're studying this system that is acting upon people in community and in dialogue and in a seminar setting with people who have experienced it directly, with people who have been stopped and frisked, with people who have been incarcerated. It's also transformative for my incarcerated students. We know this from the research. All of the research shows that for every dollar we invest in education for somebody who's incarcerated, we as a society get $5 in return. We get this because recidivism rates go down, employment rates go up. But I don't need that study, which is from the RAND Corporation, because I see it play out in my classroom every day. At the end of previous semester, one of my incarcerated students wrote in his evaluation. He said, I like the law and the policy that you taught us in this class. But most of all, what I liked was that for two hours a day, I got to walk into a seminar circle where I was treated like I was smart, where I was treated like I had something to say, where I was treated like, and on some days I even felt like an intellectual. And that two hours gave me a kind of protection, a kind of cocoon, a kind of buffer that I could carry with me throughout the week as I try to survive in this institution, which treats me like I'm the opposite of smart, I'm the opposite of a person, I'm the opposite of an intellectual. Now, some of you, so, so I would invite those of you that are educators to think about a program like Inside Out, and there are many other prison education programs um, that you can, that you can look into, and I describe some of them. Uh, on my website. But some of you might say, well, okay, but that's not for me. Let me mention another area that I think is important in this moment now as people are starting to rethink what we're doing on our criminal system, and that has to do with employment. When you are incarcerated, or you are convicted, even if you're never incarcerated. You meet, even after you've served your sentence, you meet what the activist Susan Burton calls a massive wall of no's as you try to return to society. The American Bar Association has estimated that there are only over 45,000 restrictions, limitations, prohibitions all around the country on employment. In some states, you can't get a barbering license if you have a conviction. You can't get a truck driver's license. 
you can't work in food service. You can work in the California prisons to fight fires. You know, a lot of those wildfires that you see out in California, the people fighting them are incarcerated men and women making less than a dollar a day. But when you're released, you can't get a job as a firefighter despite what might be years of experience because you can't get an EMT license, which is a precondition for becoming a firefighter. So the Ford Foundation does amazing work on criminal justice policy around the, around the world. They were doing a presentation at a New York State prison. All the top leadership from the Ford Foundation was there. And they presented their work. And all the people in the audience were incarcerated men in New York. And at the end of the presentation, one of the men raised his hand and said, thank you for this inspiring presentation. I just have one question. When I get out, could I be employed at the Ford Foundation? And there was silence in the room because they didn't know the answer. The answer was no, because like many employers, they had this massive wall of no's so that his application would never even have gotten past HR. It never would have been looked at by a human being because of his conviction of record. But to their credit, they did what more and more employers are doing, becoming fair chance employers. They scrubbed their HR policies from top to bottom. They got rid of about 90% of the exclusions, many of which people didn't even know were there, had just been piled on year after year. Some HR person goes to a conference back in the war on drugs era and is like, oh, well, we need to have all these restrictions, and they pile it in there. You talk to the dean and the president, they don't even know that this person couldn't be hired, but they can't. So they scrubbed theirs from top to bottom, and they went further than that. They created an internship program that invites people who have criminal convictions to apply for paid internships with benefits, and the idea is that if you successfully can complete it, you have a chance to be hired full time. And that's a part of the fair chance employer movement. So I would say, at your place of employment or your university or wherever you are, y'all are going out, many of you are gonna go work in organizations, you're gonna go work in law firms. Ask your employer if they're willing to become a fair chance employer and you can show them the resources for how to do so. Again, I've posted them all. Let me mention one other thing, and I want to talk about this one just because it's so, because it is something that almost everybody can do. Am I the only one that's getting warm in here? I see some people waving themselves. It's starting to feel a little bit like church and <laughs> at home. All right. Here's something that all of y'all can think about. You know, we talk about voting, and everyone talks about the importance of registering to vote and voting, and I'm not gonna talk, I'm, I mean, I believe in all of that, but I'm just not gonna say it just because y'all have probably heard it a million times. But I'm gonna mention one other place to vote that we don't talk about as much, but in Reconstruction, when this right was fought for, they understood it as a political right, like the right to vote at the ballot box, and that's the right to vote in the jury box. This is a political right. It is a right that e each of you, almost everybody in this room will have. But what happens now, I can tell you from my experience as a citizen, as a neighbor, and then as a public defender, what happens now is that a lot of people get that notice, that jury notice, and they put it at the bottom of their pile, and then if they, when they do open it up, they call and they try to get the longest extension that they can so that they don't have to serve. And then, if you're the kind of person, and I've seen this over and over again, people that are critical about what we're doing in our criminal legal system, they come down and they report to court and they say, I can't serve, I can't be fair. I was, talk to an, I was talking to an activist not that long ago to a protester. She had a sign that said, end mass incarceration. I started talk, talking to her about jury service. She said, I won't serve on a jury. I said, now wait a minute. 
I want you all to understand this. If those of you that know a little bit about what's going on in this system and think that it's a problem, that we have the largest prison system in the world, and that we have these grotesque and egregious racial disparities. If you all opt out, then the only thing that we will be left with on our juries are people who are okay with having the largest prison system in the world. And if our juries are full of people who are okay with that, the one thing we can be sure of is that's gonna continue. So please, be like me. I race to the notice. Get there as fast as you can. Get on the jury and ask your questions. And raise your points. That is the opportunity to do it. So the last thing I'm going to say before I turn it over to y'all for questions. And I started with a story from my mom. And I can't help but conclude with a story from a conversation I had with my father. And this isn't a particular policy approach, but it is a way of thinking about this problem. A couple years ago, before he, a couple years before he passed, my dad and I were watching a movie about the civil rights movement. And I asked him when it was over, what did he think? You were there. He said, I like that they presented this history on film because more people watch films than read books. As an author, I can now tell you that is true. <laughs> he said, but here's what I didn't like. He said, I didn't like that they made it seem like everybody was in the civil rights movement. He said, it wasn't like that. We were few. We were lonely. We were scared. He said, I used to go on college campuses and try to recruit students to join the movement. College administrators would run me off campus. And now those same colleges, you, I guarantee you will find somewhere in one of their buildings, they will have a tribute, a photo wall of their students that went down and fought in the movement. He said, we were unpopular. Martin Luther King was unpopular. Martin Luther King, in the months before he died, they did a Gallup poll, favorable or unfavorable. He had a two-thirds unfavorable rating. This, the March on Washington poll, three months before the march. Do you think this march will help or hurt the cause of the Negro? 60% of people said, we think it'll hurt. Well, now, today, all we have is Mar Martin Luther King speaking at the March on Washington, like that's Black History Month on loop. There were 250,000 people at the march, my dad told me. He said, but a decade later, 10 million people would say they were there. And he said, look, man, he said, I am not telling you this because I want credit for being there first. That is not my point. He said, I am telling you this because I don't like how they're showing this history because I think that this history is demoralizing to your generation. Because you see an injustice. You call a meeting And there's some activists I know out in the audience who know what I'm talking about. You call a meeting, six people show up, and five of them were at the last meeting. And then you go see this history, and you think, well, something must be wrong with my cause, because everybody understood that, and everybody joined the movement. No, they didn't. It was a few people. So what I want to say is that I don't know what is the idea that is in this room or the group of people that is in this room that is gonna have an idea, that's gonna help bring down mass incarceration and replace it with a system that deserves to have the title justice in it, a system that restores and repairs and protects communities 
without this incredible toxicity and damage and racism in our current system. I don't know who you are, but I know you're out there. SNCC was started on a college campus. I know you are there. And I know that when you come together in community, stand and recognize one another, when you overcome the fear, I know that you will rise up and you will create a movement that is gonna make our system finally just. And when you do that, they will make a movie about you. <laughs> and President Crutcher, Rodney Robinson, Dean Perdue, we will all be there together in the front row cheering you and applauding you. Thank you very much. If you have questions, if you'd come to this microphone. <laughs> My experience at lectures is that the recording is like the photographer at weddings. Very that true. is to say, like, everything has to be done in service of the recording. Oh, I got you. I got you. Thank you for those beautiful, moving, uh, rich remarks. Could you please comment on the opioid crisis and our response to that yeah. compared to what you laid out? Absolutely. Just expand on that. Yeah, no, thank you for asking that. So, one of the things that many people, including myself, have been struck by is how dramatic the rhetorical difference is in the media presentations and the political rhetoric that, in terms of the opioid crisis, as compared in particular to crack in the late 80s and early 90s. And of course, this is racialized, right? Because even though statistically, in fact, African Americans were not a major majority of crack users, that is how it was understood and portrayed and represented in the media. And so you had a media image then of a de demon people on a demon drug. And we needed to be scared. And we needed to throw them away for as long as possible. And today, there's a different kind of conversation, there's a different kind of media narrative, there are different images, there are mothers, there are magazine covers with white mothers holding their babies, looking very, very sympathetic and appealing, and there's talk about, well, what can, what can we do to save people? The problem is the drug, not the people. Whereas in the crack, the problem was the people. However, we do have those distinctions. And those then are accompanied by a, a, the fact that we haven't seen the rush to add a whole bunch of new mandatory minimums, for example. There has been at least a rhetorical move towards treatment. Having said that, I actually think that in some ways, that rhetoric of sympathy and compassion has hidden the fact that underneath the policy remains very, very uncompassionate. So what do I mean by that? We will have politicians now who will at election time traits to a rural white community and talk about how we need to tackle this opioid ep epidemic. So they're not calling the people names, but when they leave, 
What's the first thing, one of the first acts that our current president did was to try to end the Affordable Care Act, which is the legislation that is actually providing the treatment programs that we have. Many of the treatment programs that we have are funded by that legislation. So there's a rhetorical commitment to compassion, but there isn't a budget commitment. And if you, if we're not prepared, to, don't tell me, you know, I don't know who said this, but somebody said, you know, if you want to, if you want to, Show me your value, show me your budget. So unless we're putting money towards treatment programs, and here's one of the ways in which racism, and I think, again, people can, we can be misled in, in r racism in a lot of ways is, has a broader impact than, than it's, initial and direct targets. And this is a really good example of, of that. So the one place in the country right now where prison rates are increasing is rural communities. Most of them rural white communities. There's a county, there's a rural county in Ohio that has 15 times the incarceration rate. It's 97% white and it has 15 times the incarceration rate of San Francisco. What's going on? And how is it connected to racism? Well, here's how. I was meeting with a group of, of, of advocates in Wisconsin. Again, most of them operating in white communities in Wisconsin. And they explained it very clear to me. They said, because of racism, in the 80s, when we had the opportunity to fund treatment programs, when there were still existing treatment programs, we defunded them and poured all of that money into prison buildings. And that was because of racism. That's because we didn't care about the black people who needed the treatment programs at the time. But guess what? You can't imagine treatment programs out of nothing. So now, here we are today, we don't have the body of knowledge. We don't have the people trained. We don't have the physical structures. We don't have the treatment infrastructure to meet this new need because of our racist abandonment. So this is a way in which a lot of poor white folk right now are suffering because of racist decisions 30 years ago. Because again, understand, this is mostly, this is still a wealth issue. Because if you have sufficient resources, everything that I'm talking about, white or black, doesn't apply. I live in Connecticut. They had treatment programs for Wall Street and financial executives who live in Stanford and Greenwich. There's treatment programs in Connecticut with golf courses, like putting things in the basement pools. So you can get treatment today if you have money. So that is, I realize it's a little bit of a, it's a, like a multi-step answer, but I think it is crucial that we understand this because I think without that understanding, people could look at what's happening and say, oh, well, that, it, must, it must not be racism because those treatment programs that they don't have are in counties that are 97, 90, 95% white. And yes, a part of the story there is class, but also part of the story is this historical piece. The reason why we don't have the programs is because of decisions made 30 years ago. I know y'all are afraid that you're never gonna get dinner. Hi, I'm Flannery O'Rourke. I'm a 1L here. Yay. I have a comment and a question. I love 1Ls. <laughs> so first, I just want to comment and thank you for your work. I think that um, your book is really humanizing mm. in that it creates, um, it, it balances what we're not getting from the media, which mm. is that African-Americans are not 
a homogenous thing. Yeah. Thinking of the debate tonight, we think all the time, we see all these reports on, you know, white married women who are college educated think this, but then it's the black vote as a single thing. Yes. Um, my question though is I come from Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, uh, we are, our kids are about 17% African American, but the kids charged in Allegheny County are about 72% African American, so mm. it's grossly disproportionate. disproportionate. Mm. And um, Pittsburgh had, has had a constant problem with having African American, really non white representation in its police force. Mm -hmm. And so you speak a lot to your book about how a lot of these systems are not just and maybe can't be just in their current form, but how do we still make the case for representation still mattering? Yeah. Thank you, that's a great question, and thank you for that uh, initial comment. I have to say that I didn't mention it, but that what you picked up on was was one of my main goals and motivation. You know, I talked about the sto Brandon story um, and in, in talking about my motivation, I talked about right, my work in this system, but there was a companion motivation, which is that I am so frustrated, I am forever frustrated by um, this sort of monolith portrayal of the black community. And what I find so frustrating about it is that it's not like occasionally you will see an article that tries to grapple with some of the complexity, but then like the next day, everybody just reverts back to this like monolith portrayal. Like it never, it doesn't seep in. So exactly as you just said, then the next thing, it'll be full of the black community. It'll be this like complicated, nuanced story that shows all of these different um, perspectives within a white America and then it'll be the black community. I mean, Rachel Rollins, who is the new reform-minded prosecutor in Suffolk County, which includes Boston. Um, she talks about the fact that when she came into office, uh, there was, so B Boston, like Pittsburgh, has a history of very little African-American representation in its political leadership and on its police force. She talks about how right now, there's a black sheriff, there's a black police chief, and there's a black district attorney. And, and when she won, she became the third of those. And there were all of these questions that she was getting from white reporters about like, so now there's this whole like black leadership triumvirate and there was just an assumption, she says, that they were gonna agree on, on all of these issues. And she's like, there's been three white people in these jobs forever. And you never assumed that cause they were all white they were all going to think the same thing. So why would you think that about us? And so exactly. So thank you for saying that. Um, it was really a, a huge motivation of mine. Um, in terms of your question, so I really struggle. Your question about representation in some ways is the heart, is the question that I think about where I'm least sure of the answer for exactly actually the reasons you laid out in your question. So let's just talk about police departments because that's the way in which you framed it. And I'm not saying this analysis necessarily then applies to every other category of life or every, every other occupation. But for so long, and this is the story of, chapter three of my book is the story of the struggle among black political leaders on the outside to integrate police departments from a time when it was unimaginable to have a black person with a gun in the early 20th century to today, and also the struggle of individual black officers within police departments to rise up and what it looked like to have those, as those two struggles run at the same time. So in the early years, Activists thought that getting more African Americans on the police force was going to fundamentally change how police behaved. There wasn't consensus on exactly how it would do that, and that lack of consensus, I think, is 
almost represents the problem with the theory. Like some people thought that it would make African American officers less vi violent and brutal, right? That's probably the first thought that people might have as to why it would make a difference, and that was an argument. Other people thought, again, remember what my dad said about under Jim Crow, black, white officers not responding to black communities? Other people thought it would make black officers responsive to crime in black communities. It's hard for us to imagine, in a way, given the, the, the way the conversation has shifted, but there was this long period of time when the idea was that white officers wouldn't even pay attention to any kind of crime in black communities, and so black officers were thought to, would want to pay attention to it because they would feel some care and concern for black crime victims. And there were other people who adopted it on more of a kind of representation theory, like if African American communities see more black officers, then that will increase trust in law enforcement. Right, that was another theory that's, and these theories have kind of jostled around. And I think the evidence that we have today is inconclusive, but what there is suggests that the structures and incentives and training of police and the job that we give them to do is more powerful than all of that. And that fundamentally, Black officers don't make a significant difference on any of those dimensions because what matters is all of these other things, history, culture, structure, incentives, supervision, and you slot black officers into these jobs and they end up doing, again, on average, generalization, roughly the same job. Now, I still believe in hiring more black police officers, but I, adopt it not on a representation theory, I adopt it on a fair employment and redress for past discrimination theory. So I, for example, am an aggressive supporter that a city like New Haven should hire more black firefighters because black firefighters were historically kept out of those jobs. And I believe that Yale should hire more black construction workers because black Construction workers were and are discriminated against in the building trades. But I don't do that because I think black firefighters are gonna fight fire any differently or black builders are gonna build any differently. I do that because of a racial justice, fair employment, and history of discrimination rationale. And I apply the same rationale to police departments. That's just me. Now, I know that's not appealing because it doesn't resonate in the same way. Um, and we want to have this idea that if we bring blacks, African Americans, or black people on the force, that we'll see a different kind of policing. But I think that's just a hope that's born out of our incredible frustration with how police have treated black people. But it's not a hope that's based on, a, on, on much evidence. And I think it's mostly um, contradicted by the evidence. Perception, yay. <laughs> That's what everybody's waiting for. Uh, my name is Antaeus Edelson. I'm also a 1L here. And first, I want to thank you for writing the book, for coming to speak to us. And mm -hmm. I also want to thank uh, Dean Perdue and the university for providing us your book as a welcome gift and having you come to uh, speak to us and educate us. Oh, I uh, love that as a welcome gift. <laughs> so I would uh, just want to touch back on the program, the uh, Inside Out program, oh, yeah. and get uh, your ideas on what schools, communities, and to me it seems almost like it has to be larger, at least at the state level, how that can be better integrated into uh, the public education system or universities and how uh, that can be expanded and really entrenched into society and the education culture. Uh, were you planted? <laughs> were you in the conversation earlier? Okay, look, everybody in the room, all of the teachers who do work in prison education in whatever way you define it, please stand up right now because I want you to see who these folks are because you need to be talking to them. 
And come on, come on, don't be, y'all weren't shy around the table, don't be shy now. And are there, are there any students in the room who have taken classes with any of the folks or any other folks have taken classes in, yes? Stand up, I'm not even, I mean, I'm happy to honor you, but mainly I want this gentleman to see who you are so that y'all can connect. Okay. So there's, so there's, the reason I asked folks to do that was because we were just having a conversation in which we identified, a group of people around the table identified all of these different programs and pockets and initiatives. There's a number of different juvenile facilities, adult facilities that people are teaching in, that they're bringing students to, that people are taking tours of. There's lots of different, uh, there's a gentleman who's um, collecting music and has developed an incredible archive of music done by incarcerated people. There's a lot that's happening right now on this campus and I sensed at the table an eagerness to think about how could some of those efforts be consolidated? How could people work together to collaborate in some way to have yet more impact um, than people were having individually? And it doesn't mean that people should stop with doing what they're doing at all, um, because there's lots of reasons, uh, academic freedom and otherwise, why people might choose particular ventures um, that meet their pedagogical or research or, or, or social justice needs, but it does mean that there's an opportunity. Um, the most, I think, one crucial aspect of any collaboration that's around um, prison education is that the students who are incarcerated have to get credit for the work that they're doing, for starters. And on top of that, as much as possible, and this is why collaboration is important, the program should be knitted together in some way so that over time, students are earning their way towards some sort of degree. It can be, it might be a GED, it could be a high school diploma if you're teaching at that level. It might be a two-year degree. It could even be, and more and more universities are thinking about this, a four-year degree. And normally it's a building up process, right? A lot of places start with how they can do it as a two-year degree, and then they, or they start with classes. And then a, 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 a you know, an ecosystem of classes is developed and then people start to say, wait a minute, if we put these together, this could, this starts to look like uh, general studies or a liberal arts or other two-year degree and then you start to think about um, a four-year degree. That's the work, it took me four years to figure out a way to get credit for my incarcerated students, which I finally this semester for the first time am able to offer. So it's a, it's a process because you're dealing with two bureaucracies, right? Two institutions that have norms and rules and boards of governors and otherwise corrections and universities, right? And neither of those is famous for moving quickly. <laughs> Especially when you're talking about something that is, at least for some, not for everybody, not even for most, right? But for some, it can feel threatening. On the correction side, education can sometimes feel like a threat. And on the university side, prisoners can sometimes feel like a threat, right? So each side is very cautious, and, um, but there is a national uh, network. Again, I've, I've, I've put a bunch of resources on this topic in particular um, on my Take Action page. Um, but I actually think that if you go talk to some of the folks that stood up, um, you will quickly get absorbed into a group of folks and, and eventually a movement that I think is likely to have really profound impact on this campus in the years to come. Dr. Solomon, thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank